Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our mentoring hour. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, may, I just want to invite maybe uh, John. Uh, can you please lead us in prayer? Okay. Uh, Pastor Roshan. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Sir. Father, we come before you today. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, your kindness, Lord, over our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness that sustains us every day. Father, our Lord, even as we are gathered together in your name, Father, to learn more about you and your kingdom, I pray that in every question that is being asked, I pray, Lord, that you get to know you more and more. I pray for that you pour out your wisdom, um, your knowledge, and your understanding with them, even as they answer the questions. Father, we thank you for everything that you're doing in and through us. Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Roshan. Uh, all right, so we'll keep this time open. Uh, so feel free to please share your questions uh, and your thoughts, your learnings. Um, you can either unmute and ask your questions or you can post your questions on the chat as well. Right, I think last week, uh, towards the end of the session, we got a question, but uh, we didn't really, yes. Yes, uh, Dinah has put the question on the chat. Um, is it right for married couples to have their conjugal rights when they are fasting? Uh, so last week this question came in and uh, we didn't have time to answer this question. So uh, yes, our faculty is here. Uh, so would any one of us please be willing to share some light on this question, please? Pastor Ashish, uh, uh, um, thank you, Pastor. Yeah, yeah. So um, the uh, you know, I guess the place to go to is First Corinthians chapter seven, where, uh, where uh, uh, Paul gives us instruction, and he says, you know, uh, don't deprive each other, except when you are fasting. So the implication is that while they are fasting, they're not uh, engaging uh, in their conjugal rights or their sexual relationship. And then they come back together uh, after that time of fasting. So that's First Corinthians uh, chapter seven. I think it's the first four verses. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, or first so five, yeah. I'll just type this here. <clears throat> Seven, one, two, five. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor. Uh, yes. So we'll continue to leave this time open for questions. Uh, if you'd like to, uh, you know, it could even be things that you have, you know, been learning uh, over the past a week or over the past month and. Holy Spirit has been teaching you something. If there's something that you'd like to uh, share with us or uh, uh, throughout the courses that you're studying, uh, questions, feel free to ask us now. Paul, would you like to share uh, about uh, what you've been learning over the past week? Uh, uh, you know, what the Lord has been teaching you and something that, you know, uh, God is ministering to you over the week or over the month, over the recent times. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts? Uh... Hello. Yes, go ahead, Paul. I want I wanted to understand the difference between the Holy Spirit 
and the Holy Ghost. Are they the same? Are they different? When should we use the word Holy Ghost and when should we use the word Holy Spirit? I don't understand them. Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that question. Uh, uh, the the word Holy the, the words the, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost is the same. Uh, the older version, the King James version, uh, usually refers to the Holy Ghost and uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the the words the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost is the same person. Uh, so it's just different translations which uh, which indicate uh, you know Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit, uh, but it is uh, referred to the same the person the third person of the Trinity. Uh, would any other any other faculty you'd like to add their thoughts on this? Uh, I'm not from any part of All right. Yeah. Yes, Paul. So uh, it's the same. Would do you have any follow up question with that? Uh, no, I now understand. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yes, uh, we we'll continue to leave this time open. Feel free to share questions. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, Nikilson. Uh, you've raised your hand. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Morning. Everyone. I just wanted to ask with regard to oh, sorry, one second. Yeah, sorry, I'm just muting the speaker. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, Nikki. Yeah. So I was I was just reading Acts chapter six where it talks about the seven who were chosen to serve, who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, applying that into choosing volunteers or people who serve at our church. I, this is a personal take on it, of course. When it comes to um, volunteering, somehow I feel there's like a little bit of a gray area when we see, uh, say if we want someone who we may think is not a strong believer, we say join the ushering team. But when it comes to like the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, the worship team or the ministry team, then of course we know why we say you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. and more built up but as per acts chapter 6 we see even the simplest of teams they were required to be filled with the holy spirit so how do we go about this is this it would be great to have them all filled by the holy spirit but is there a line where uh, so that's part one of the question do they have to be filled with the holy spirit part two would be i've seen uh, quite a few worship leaders uh, use that as a way of ministry, you know, which is the right way. Um, some people use, they may not have the best lifestyle, but there are still people in the worship team and slowly they change and become strong believers. It goes either way. And some churches have the rule that you have to be a certain firm foundation believer to be part of the worship team. So that would be question two. Where do you draw that line? Right. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Nikki, for that question. Uh, uh, I will just try to answer the first one and then go to the second part of your question. So the first part of uh, Nikki's question was uh, in Acts uh, seven. Uh, it, it was uh, it was time to you know it, the the widows were feel were feeling that they were being ignored, and so uh, they decided to choose seven men full of the Holy Spirit and their task was menial which was just to serve food so Nikki's question is uh, even during even now when we choose volunteers uh, maybe if it's for uh, you know in terms of uh, ushering or uh, sound and setup team uh, Nikki's question is do they have to be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, uh, because we know that if there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, volunteers needed for maybe uh, uh, sharing the word or worship team, they have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But what about these, uh, you know, uh, smaller uh, teams? Uh, do they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So uh, could one of our faculty please uh, throw some light on this? Uh, 
Pastor, uh, Pastor Ashish, uh, would you mind sure, sure. sharing your thoughts? Thank you, please. Yeah. So, um, just from, I guess, uh, from what you know, we've been able to learn over this last uh, twenty some years here in APC. Um, when it comes to uh, so. Uh, even among volunteers and people serving in church, uh, we draw a distinction between um, uh, those who are directly involved in a spiritual uh, form of ministry and those who are involved in the uh, helps type of ministry. So a spiritual form of ministry uh, would, of course, do with preaching, teaching the word, uh, leading a life group, being involved in worship, uh, anything that that involves, <clears throat> you know, uh, ministering to people in a spiritual manner, which includes worship, of course. So for that, <clears throat> we definitely uh, want to uh, keep higher standards. And 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 Paul uh, gives that. Uh, I'm just typing this here. First Timothy three one to uh, one to seven. So. He, first Timothy 3, 1 to 7, he talks about uh, bishop. Bishop is a spiritual overseer. So in any form of spiritual oversight, uh, whether it's a life group on to you know, overseeing a church or a congregation or spiritual ministry, children's church, um, all these are spiritual. There uh, we have to have, um, uh, you know, our, our requirements, of course, will be much stronger, stricter. Uh, they have to have the spiritual uh, required spiritual standing, along with the practical side. Yes, for example, worship means, of course, they you know you have your audition and you see that they are of a certain level, etc. Then, when it comes to the helps type of ministry, where uh, you know Paul refers, uh, the New Testament calls this uh, deacons. That means uh, they're not directly involved in spiritual ministry, but they're helping in the church. Any kind of whether it's an usher. Uh, whether it's uh, 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 you know parking lot or uh, doing PowerPoint or whatever, you know, these are all helps type of ministry. Uh, there again, First Timothy three eight to thirteen, the requirements are there. That means their life testimony has to be good, but uh, it's not stringent on the spiritual side because they're not spir directly spiritually <clears throat> imparting something to people. They're just helping in the church. So there uh, again, uh, life testimony is important but uh, you're not looking so much on the spiritual uh, capacity. So to answer your question, uh, in both these cases, you know, life testimony is important. Uh, you, uh, uh, you be, and, and at the same time, we want to be welcoming to people. Uh, so, uh, and, and the other thing uh, we also, uh, also learned is, that you know, any volunteer actually represents the church and reflects back on the church. You know, for example, uh, when the, I'm just giving the kind of problems we face in church. You know, suppose you have a girl who's wearing sleeveless and she is, you know, going around as an usher. I'm sure on Monday I'll get an email or a phone call. Pastor, we saw this uh, girl. She's wearing sleeveless in church and she was an usher. In our minds, hey, at least she's come to just be an usher. But people look at that as a reflection of the church. And this has happened, I mean, many times, you know, uh, just because of the, the clothes that person is wearing, we'll get a call or a message or an email. You know, somebody just serving communion, somebody taking offering, somebody standing and greeting people. You know, we, we, we take all this, like, you know, we want to support, we want to encourage these people to serve. But the way the congregation sees it is these people are representing the church, even if they're standing there to greet people. You know, they're representing the church. They're a volunteer. And so they expect a certain standard in outward form and, you know, in, in, in of course, in life testimony and so on. And so I think um, uh, to answer your question, uh, we should... Uh, Follow the biblical standards. It's in First Timothy three, uh, verses one to one to thirteen, for spiritual ministry and for helps ministry. That's that's a standard given to us in the Bible. Uh, we want to be welcoming to people, but even as we welcome people, we let them know that look, this is a responsibility. 
even if you're serving as a greeter, you're actually representing God and the the work of the ministry to the people. So you now we expect these standards. And uh, and uh, and then the other side is, you know, depending on the nature of ministry, you look out for uh, the spiritual capabilities. Now, Acts six is somewhat confusing because, well, these people are only serving food, but why is the requirement they should be full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit? All they're doing is serving food. You know, it's just a helps ministry. Uh, but I think in that situation, there was not only serving food, but there was also the dealing with the problem of, you know, the the, the situation was where the the Hebrew speak the the Hebrew speaking believers and the Greek speaking believers were there was tension there, and I think uh, so. While serving food is just a simple helps thing, the the you know they they, they needed people. At, you know, with this full of the spirit and wisdom, given the situation, they needed uh, people that way. Now we don't, we shouldn't take that and uh, mandate it for every kind of helps ministry, because when you come later to First Timothy three eight to thirteen, uh, that describes helps ministry, and uh, you know, there's no mention of uh, uh, you know the spirit. I mean, meaning other than life testimony, he's not saying that they should be filled with the spirit and wisdom. So I think we can be a real, little relaxed in that sense. I hope that uh, answers, uh, Nikki, uh, I'm just... Yes, Pastor. Very clear. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that detailed answer. Uh, so, Nikki, uh, you may have to help me with the second part of your question. Uh, you said that there will be people who will uh, you know, be joining the worship team uh, and uh, during the course of their being volunteers in the worship team, uh, you know, they they get more inclined towards uh, the working of the Holy Spirit and there's a change in their hearts. So uh, can you help me with the second part of your question, please? Sure, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I think Pastor answered it already with the okay. first thing. So All right. Right, it's pretty clear, the spiritual aspect of it and the natural, so the lifestyle. Sure. So. sure. Sure. Do you, uh, should I repeat it or is it okay? I've, I've got my answer. All right, that's fine. That's fine, okay, Nikki. Thank sure. you so Thank much. You. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Right. Uh, yes. So we'll continue to leave this time open. Uh, please feel free to post your questions, or you can unmute and ask your questions as well. Right. Uh, there was a question that uh, came up in one of our sessions. Um, uh, uh, Pastor, I, I would just like to ask this question. Uh, you know, uh, one of the students had asked me this, and I was not really sure of the answer. Uh, the, the question was, uh, uh, during the time when Daniel was uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the, they were taken into captivity uh, into Babylon. Uh, history said that uh, in the article that the student read said that, uh, you know, usually the people who were taken uh, uh, into Babylon as captives were, uh, you know, they were castrated and then they were, you know, asked to work in Babylon. Uh, and so uh, his question was, uh, is that the reason why Daniel did not get married and have children. Uh, could that be one of the reasons? No. Uh, I, I did not have any historical proof or any Bible verse to support that. So uh, uh, maybe any one of us uh, faculty, if you have any thoughts on this, uh, feel free to share your thoughts, please. Yeah, Paul, I'm just like you. I, I don't have any Bible, I mean, historical information. Uh, but if that was true, then, yeah, that's uh, an obvious conclusion. 
you know, if they were. Uh, but um, practically, I can't imagine them doing this to all the Jewish captives. You know, there were thousands of people taken captives to Babylon. So practically, I don't think they would do it. Uh, I mean, if if it was done just for the selected people who are supposed to be trained in the, you know, the Nebuchadnezzar's uh, court, maybe that's more practical. And if, if that was actually done historically, then yeah, that's an obvious conclusion. Yeah, but I think uh, it shouldn't break our heads on something like yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Right, Avni has got a question. Uh, Pastor, need some light on 1 Corinthians 15, 29 to 30, please. Right, let's just get that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 29 and 30. Just looking for the verse, I'll put that up there. Okay, thanks Diana for putting up the verse. All right, so the verse says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Verse 30, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Avdi, thank you for the question. But, uh, is there anything particular on these two verses that you're looking at, or you just wanted some, uh, you know, your thoughts on this? Yes. Uh, what it says about uh, why will they do who are baptized for the dead? I mean, why are the people who are alive taking baptism uh, for the dead? Okay. So that is what I didn't understand. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Avni, for that question. Right. Uh, we leave this question open. Any of our faculty, please feel free to uh, throw some light on this, please. Yeah, I'll just uh, respond to that. Um, right. um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 15, actually, Paul is addressing um, an issue of... Uh, um, yeah, he's just reiterating the fact that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again. You know? um, so he's, um, uh, I mean, he's giving all these, um, uh, you know, uh, all the facts, all the proof uh, of the fact that he, after he, if you read through 1 Corinthians 15, you see that, you know, he was buried uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 4, he talks about how he was buried, he rose again according to the scriptures and, and uh, because people were, some of them were saying that uh, he did not rise again. Okay, so he's giving all the proofs uh, of um, who were the witnesses and 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 uh, you know the first part of it, and then he comes to um, so he's he's giving you know one by one. Um, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is uh, futile, and you are still in your sins. You know, so they can't be a teaching that Christ is uh, Christ did not rise from the dead. So while addressing that, he comes to this verse twenty nine, and then he says uh, he uh, he seems to be it's not very clear, but he seems to be referring to some practice that was there. Um, uh, while uh, you know there seems to be some form of a, you know a baptism for the uh, sake of the ones who had probably not baptized but who died you know while not uh, he's not um, you know subscribing to that uh, practice but he's saying you know even if you look at that you know why are people doing that because they have some hope that there is a resurrection you know he's he's referring to that uh, some, some practice that was in nowhere do we see uh, paul actually affirming that or subscribing to that practice but he refers to that um that maybe some practice that was happening there and he's saying you know even if you look at that um they are doing it with the hope that there will be a resurrection you know that is why they are doing it so and then he comes to the question if the dead do not rise at all why then you know are they doing it so um so his uh, point there is to uh is to reiterate the fact that there is uh, there is a resurrection that Christ did rise from the dead, and uh, and because of that we have hope, um, and so on. So so that's the reason he's uh, you know he's referring to that practice. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other extra biblical evidence of this kind of a practice in Corinth. Probably if someone else can add, um, uh, that'll be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor Jakes. Uh, yes, anyone else would uh, like to add? Mr. Ashish, uh, Mr. Selina, Pastor Nancy. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Pastor Paul, and thank you, Avani, for your question. I think this uh, whole thing of being uh, of uh, people be baptized in the dead is something that Paul is looking at uh, people outside the church who are doing it. And uh, just like uh, Pastor Jake said, they do this because it indicates that they have some confidence uh, in the life that is after death. But uh, Paul is nowhere teaching about uh, this practice uh, about baptizing the dead, uh, but he's just pointing out to people who are doing it outside the church. And I think in verses 30 to 32, uh, Paul is just uh, talking about his own life, where the, he's talking about the sacrifices he's making, the dangers he suffers, uh, and, you know, that uh, he has to, he's uh, facing that almost every day. Uh, and uh, he's saying this, that he's also, uh, you know, facing a lot of opposition. He's also fought wild animals at Ephesus. And he's saying, you know, why do I have to endure all of this uh, if I don't believe that I will be resurrected uh, from the dead one day and I will have the, I hope, have the hope of uh, eternal life. So if you don't have that hope, then, uh, you know, we can just uh, live life uh, based on the here and now we don't have uh, you know uh, if, the, if we don't have that hope there's no point in going through all these struggles so paul is saying i'm going through all these struggles and these difficulties because i have this eternal hope this assurance uh, that i will receive the crown of life that i will have this uh, hope that i will be resurrected uh, from this uh, natural body into a spiritual body which he talks about you know the incorruptible uh, the imperishable uh, the immortal body that he will receive. And so he's not uh, uh, any way, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to say that, you know, we need to baptize the dead. He is not for that kind of teaching, but he's just pointing to people outside the church. But he's also talking about the assurance that we as believers have that we will be resurrected from the dead because Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. And because he resurrected from the dead, we too will be resurrected. I hope that uh, answer helps. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. He's not advocating that. Yes, <laughs> I was not able to get the right word. Thank you, Pastor. I hope uh, it helped, uh, uh, Sister Ravini. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Avni. Oh, right. uh, Taisha has raised her hand. Please go ahead, Taisha. Hi, good morning, everyone. Morning. Pastor, as um, Pastor Selena was mentioning about the dead, a question that I see persons ask, and I've seen they're doing, um, praying for the dead. They, um, I know the Bible says, um, Jesus mentioned that the dead take care of the dead, um, but pray, praying for the dead, should we, we, should we as Christian be praying for the dead? I know I have Jewish friends that they light their candles and they pray for the dead. They remember them. But should we as Christians pray for the dead? Thank you so much, Tasha, for that question. Yes. Uh, uh, Pastor Nancy, would you mind please uh, sharing your thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you Taisha, for the question. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, so um, from what we see in scripture, Taisha, I think praying for the dead may not make any difference in their spiritual standing before God, because we see in uh, Hebrews 9 verse 27, we see that um, uh, it is appointed for uh, you know man to die once after which uh, is judgment. So whatever one does in their lifetime you know that is what determines their spiritual destiny and the way they will be um, judged by god you know during the judgment so as those who are living i think what we can do is to remember the dead because we also see um, I forget exactly what that was it but uh, it's like the memory of a righteous man is blessed so to remember the dead to learn from their lives to um, you know celebrate the legacy that they've left behind that's a different thing which i think we can do uh, and we should do because it's like honoring uh, you know, people uh, who who were part of your life uh, but beyond that 
know praying for the dead doing rituals for the dead all those things have no basis in scripture uh, so yeah i think I, I will leave it with that and i hope uh, that answers your question daisha yes yes pastor i thought so as well because i'm okay. not particular about anything with the dead i but okay. i didn't want to seem harsh but i just I, i'm not for it i'm sorry um another question i have if you would allow me is yes please what, go ahead what if you are seeing the dead now let me explain as i am gifted in the prophetic and the lord will will give me visions at different points but i have and but i keep seeing a vision before of um two individual they're dead the daughter the grandma and the son one he committed suicide and the other i don't know how she died i just heard she died but the member is of my care group right but the the family member they're dead i don't know them i didn't even know that this person was her mom i saw her on the road but then she i just said i saw the picture on there when they were doing the memorial for her and i said oh i knew that lady she was your mom so i have no connections to them however i spoke to a friend of mine a prophet and he says i said why is it i keep seeing the dead it constantly and i keep praying for the daughter i keep praying for the one that i know that is alive and praying and i saw she put up something that she's going through a rough time but a friend of mine was saying that it could be that the 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 dead they they don't permit the dead shouldn't be talking to you but it could be that they're saying they remembered that someone died and that was in christ and but it's like their spirit came to them or something and say pray remember remember my family in prayer you know something like that so i immediately started praying for the family when i heard that and after i prayed for the family they i saw the boat dead, they kept, they walked hand in hand and went away. So um, I'm just asking, the question I'm asking is, is uh, have that, has that ever happened to anyone before? Yeah, thank you so much, Teresa, for that question. Uh, personally, to me, it's not happened. Uh, uh, but yes, if any one of our faculty would please like to share your thoughts, maybe experiences on this. Uh, Pastor Ashish. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, thanks for sharing that. Now, um, now, so I think there are two two separate uh, things to think about here. One is, uh, you know, if you are in, if we are in some way reminded about someone who's dead or either God speaks to us about them in a dream or in a vision or something, if we are some, somewhat reminded of, or you know, um, brought our attention to somebody who's dead, uh, if, if it is from the Holy Spirit, then of course we need to look to the Holy Spirit uh, to find out what he wants us to do, right? So they could be some examples of situations, meaning there could be some unresolved matter that needs to be dealt with. Maybe the person needs to release, uh, you know, they're holding grudge against somebody and the person's already dead. So that is, I'm just giving you different scenarios. Or maybe God is calling this person to take up a work that was unfinished by that person and get it done. So, so there are different reasons why God could, the Holy Spirit could remind us of somebody who has been dead. But if it is, uh, 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 so that's if it is really from the Holy Spirit. But if it is somebody's own uh, emotions at work, which would happen in the case where, I mean, I'm not saying in, your, in this particular case that you spoke about, but I'm just talking in general. Uh, if there's somebody has lost a loved one or a close friend, of course, the remembrance of the dead may not necessarily be from the Holy Spirit. It's just their own emotions at work. And that needs time to, you know, you need time to let go and all of that. So that's one part of it. When, when, when we are reminded or our attention is brought to somebody who's dead, we 
and the Lord is doing it, then we ask the Lord, Lord, why are you doing this? And what is the purpose behind it? And then we follow through on what the Lord wants us to do. But the second part, separate part. So in your case, if the you know if if the if the Lord has been bringing this to you, then it, the right thing to do is to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do uh, concerning this person? Do I need to minister to that person uh, who uh, or to that family who uh, has lost the grandma and the other person? And I think you mentioned one of them went away by suicide. So do I need to minister to that family? Is there something? Uh, you know, that needs to be done for that family, for that household, or maybe for an individual in that family uh, in relation to, you know, people who have passed on. So maybe the Lord is, you know, wanting some work to be done, and which probably you already did through your praying. So the correct response that you took was you prayed, and uh, you may have prayed uh, in the spirit for the individual or the household or the family uh, to bring certain closure or healing or, un you know, to deal with certain work in their family in relation to people who've passed on. And so, so that's a good thing you did. But the other part, which uh, is, uh, I think I would defer is, um, you see, when people die, the spirits don't move around on earth, right? The spirits go either to God, if they're a believer, the spirit goes to the Lord. And second, if they're not believers, the spirit goes to hell, right? Um, Hades, hell. So the spirits don't move around here. The spirits don't have any means to contact us here. Uh, nothing of that. So that's where, you know, when you mentioned that somebody said the spirit may be coming and reminding you, that would not be true. It's, you don't find that uh, supported in scripture. Because if, you know, the spirits are either going to the Lord or they're going to hell. So I would leave that part out. But definitely the way you responded to the situation in prayer, I think is a correct response. I hope that helps. Yes, boss, I was trying to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Taisha, for that question. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, yes, Charles has put up a question here. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe this question has been asked, but I need more clarity. It's about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. What will happen to a born-again person? Uh, sorry, Charles, uh, would you mind unmuting and asking the question? Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 and 14. All right. Um, thank you so much, Pastor. Um, I'm asking about this when uh, Paul writes and says um, things will be tried by fire. Things will be tried by fire and that there are those that whose works will be uh, tested and, and tried and when they survive fire, they will be given a reward. And those that will be burnt will be saved, but they will not get a reward. I, I would like to have some more clarity about those verses. Okay, about that part of the chapter. Yes, th thank you so much, Charles, for clarifying that. Uh, I'll just add a few thoughts and then uh, leave it open to our faculty as well. Uh, here, Paul is writing... Uh, uh, to the believers, and uh, he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, the the judgment, uh, the judgment day of Christ, where we all, as believers, will stand before the Lord, and uh, uh, when we stand before the Lord, uh, we will have we'll give an account of our works. So our works will be tested, and so Paul is writing there, and he's saying our works will be tested by fire, uh, and he gives the example of uh, wood, hay, and uh, uh, gold uh, uh, and he says okay uh, when you put it into fire the works our works will be tested by fire whether the works that we did uh, was it out of the flesh uh, was it done so that you know to please somebody else or uh, was it done because we love the lord because we want to serve the lord because we want to grow um, uh, you know in the works of the holy spirit in our lives so Every work of every believer, uh, the Lord will test it by fire. 
uh, the second part of your question is if anyone's work which has been built on endures he uh, he will receive a reward so as the work has been tested the lord jesus will reward us uh, now remember that the judgment seat of christ is uh, is 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 the place where only the believers will be uh, will stand before the, the throne of god and give an account of their lives um, so those works those who have served the lord faithfully uh, and uh, you know and lived their life done the ministry faithfully their works will be endured meaning they will receive a reward uh, but those in the sense that does not uh, you know the the work has been tested but it's not really uh, you know there there is not much of a reward but they shall be saved by grace in the sense that you know there will be times when uh, maybe somebody or uh, you know a believer has you know served in the ministry but uh, the reason for serving could be that you know he wanted he or she uh, there could be wrong reasons and uh, because of that uh, there there was there'll be no reward but through God's grace, that person uh, will be saved. Uh, so uh, I leave it at that. Maybe any other faculty can, any other faculty can please share uh, your thoughts on this. First Corinthians three thirteen to fourteen. Pastor Jakes, uh, Pastor Selina, Pastor Nancy. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, just to add to what uh, Pastor Paul shared, um, the context in which. Um, you know, this verse is there is is actually uh, Paul is actually referring to the ministers of God and you know, who are actually ministering in Corinth, like Apollos and and Cephas and so on. And there seems to be a you know kind of a, um, a sectarianism that's happening. People you know pulling in different directions and saying I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and so on. So, so Paul is clarifying that, and he's saying you know who is Paul, who is Apollos, and uh, while he does that. Uh, he says, you know, we are all part of the same team. One waters, one sows, one waters. But God is the one who gives increase. Um, but then he talks about his work, how he lays the foundation, and uh, the foundation being the uh, the Lord Jesus. And he's talking about, you know, uh, be careful how one builds on that foundation. You know, the kind of work that you do, the kind of ministry that you do, and the kind of materials that you uh, use. You know, he's talking about the kind of efforts. Um, it, it, uh, is the ministry uh, the way in which you minister to the church or to the to the people i mean here in this context is it of lasting value is it will it stand the test of time will it stand in that day uh when it's says by fire so he's saying you know are you using some substantive materials to build the lives of people you know will it be of eternal value so he's talking about all that and then says you know it the work will be clear in the sense you know will it stand on that day will uh, the whatever effort whatever work that you put in um you know uh, was it to build the person up to make the person strong and uh, was it uh, you know will it will it stand so um just wanted to add that um and uh, and and of course the reward based on whether the work um, is is of eternal value whether it stands right uh, thank you thank you so much pastor jakes uh charles uh, I hope that answers your question. Oh, thank you so much, uh, brethren. Thank you, Charles. Uh, right, we have a couple of minutes more, uh, so feel free to, uh, you know, unmute, ask your question. You can also post a question on the chat. Oh, can I ask one question? Please go ahead, John. This is uh, from Second Corinthians chapter ten, initial couple of verses. Um, so uh, my question is: so in verse four, five, we read about the weapons of our warfare, uh, the importance of uh, casting down arguments, and so on. And verse six, uh, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So. Um, Starting from verse one, I just wanted to get a connection with uh, weapons of our warfare and the verse six. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, John, for that question. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Pastor Ashish, would you mind please sharing your thoughts? Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, Second Corinthians ten, uh, uh, one on through verse six. Uh, Paul, let me just look at that again. I don't want to just speak of, uh, yeah. So 
um, Paul is, uh, yeah, uh, we use these verses often, of course, to uh, talk about the weapons of our warfare and so on. But uh, I think if you look at the overall context, um, uh, Paul is uh, addressing um, issues in the Corinthian church. And in that context, he's bringing up these weapons of our warfare. And, uh, and, and of course, the weapons of our warfare are dealing with things in the mind, right? So it's not like we are pulling things up in the air, but it's dealing with things in the mind. He's talking about strongholds, casting down imaginations, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and so on. And then he says, uh, once that obedience in the Corinthian church has been established, then they can extend that to others. Yeah, having in readiness um, uh, to, that's, that's verse six, uh, having in readiness to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, right? So really the whole purpose of uh, engaging in this warfare, spiritual warfare, is bringing believers to this place of obedience. And when they are in that place of obedience, they're able to extend, you know, uh, uh, influence on other forms of disobedience, ready, being ready to punish all disobedience after your obedience is fulfilled. So uh, if you look at the whole picture, what Paul is telling, what is Paul is dealing with in the Corinthian church, he's saying, look, there are a lot of these issues, but God has given the weapons of warfare. So here in this case, it's uh, Paul and his team. And through those weapons, they're going to deal with these things that are operating in the mind in the midst of the believers. And the whole purpose of that is to bring them to a place of obedience. And then they can work with him to punish disobedience. If you read later on in, in that same 10th chapter, you'll find that Paul invites them uh, to be part of extending, later on, you know, to extending the ministry beyond the Corinthian church itself. So that's, again, another context where he's saying, and it's not having to do with warfare or the mind, but he's, he's, he's inviting them to extend the ministry beyond uh, their own, that sphere of influence, which included the Corinthians. So to answer your question, um, if, you know, uh, many times we apply these verses at a personal level, you know, pull down strongholds and all that, uh, which, which all of us is true. But if you look at it in the context in which it was written, Paul is saying, look, you know, he's got these, he's got these situations to deal with in the Corinthian church. But God's given weapons to deal with those things. All of these things are in the mind. They're dealing with thoughts, imaginations, reasonings, arguments, thoughts. And He's able to extend that influence, bring those thoughts captive, so on, ultimately resulting in obedience. But you know, you cannot force obedience in the people of God. You can facilitate obedience through spiritual warfare, through praying, through pulling down strongholds. But they have to come into this place of obedience. And when they are in a place of obedience, then that can be extended to uh, the regions beyond or beyond that church or beyond. Uh, the people who've come into obedience, they can bring the others who are in disobedience, they can bring them into obedience. So that's kind of the train of thought uh, in, in what he's writing. Uh, so what, what, is the, what is the takeaway? Uh, the takeaway is for us as spiritual leaders, uh, we can and we should extend our spiritual authority to deal with things that are happening that are disturbing the life of the church this way, right? And many times I've done that when I see things happening. I know this is this is the battle. You're dealing with arguments, reasons that are floating around. So through prayer, you deal with it so that people in the congregation, there's, you know, you're facilitating. You're not overriding human will. Of course, obedience is always an act of will. But through your exercise of spiritual authority, you're enabled to bring people into alignment, into a place of obedience. And then that can be extended to others. I, I hope I explained that, John. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Back to you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Uh, 
All right, we've uh, come to our to the end of uh, the session. Uh, let's just quickly close in prayer. Thank you, Nicholson, uh, uh, for sharing the link for the book, The Refiner's Fire. Thank you. All right, let's just close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful time that you've given us where we could just come together and, uh, and Lord, uh, uh, just ask questions and share our thoughts. Lord, we pray that even as we continue today and the coming week, that your Holy Spirit will be with us, Lord, to minister, to bring guidance, to bring comfort, to bring revelation into our hearts, Lord. I pray that you will be with each one of us and help us, Lord, to grow from strength to strength, from glory to glory, giving glory only to your name. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining this time. Uh, have a great day ahead. Uh, God bless. Bye now.